Earlier this week, we have learned that The Lion King is the next Disney animated classic to be made in a live action film. I don't know. I don't know. Does it make me a conservative or a purist if I think it's not such a great idea? Eh, uh, anyway. For those who might not have seen uh, the, this movie, The Lion King tells the story of Simba, a young lion who is to succeed his father, Musafa, as king of the, pri the Pride Lands. Um, however, uh, after Simba's uh, uncle murdered Musafa, Simba is manipulated to, into thinking he was responsible and flee into exile. The clip I would like to show you the, t in a few seconds is one of the uh, turning point in the movie. So let's watch this. You know my father? Correction. I know your father. I hate to tell you this, but he died a long time ago. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> He's alive, and I'll show him to you. You follow old Rafiki, he knows the way. Come on. <sighs> Don't dodge me. Hurry up! Hey, whoa, wait, wait. Come on. Come on! Would you slow down? Stop! That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Remember. Father. Remember. Remember who you are. These few words could easily be the subtitle of the first biblical text we use today. The second letter to Timothy is another example, another epistle of an epistle written in the voice of Paul, probably a generation or two after the death of the apostle. It's also different from the other uh, epistles because Paul's letters sound often like by bylaws of a church or attempt to solve all the problems of the first Christian communities. Here, the beginning of 2 Timothy is more intimate, if I may say. It's almost like we're reading someone else's mail. And here, the author exhort Timothy to remember where it come from. 
He is encouraged to remember the faith he received from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. He is called to remember the gift of God that is within him. Timothy, says the author, remember who you are. And I believe the lectionary could not have given us a better gift on this Sunday during which we are invited to remember the first worship of Canada United Church 50 years ago. Anniversaries are always a great time to look back and to contemplate all the amazing achievements of a group, of a community. Uh, some in our community still can testify of the incredible journey that led this church to meet first in a community center and then to two different schools and finally to this building. Many remember with fondness past ministers, um, intern student ministers who took care and also fed the people through the years. I'm sure many stories could be told about choir practices, uh, Sunday school classes, marriage and counter evenings, uh, lectures by uh, John Shelby Spong and John Bell, and many other amazing events during the last 50 years. We can remember our story, the stories that shape us and made us who we are today. However, anniversary could also be a mixed blessing. As we look at the great achievements of our past and compare it to today's reality, uh, we cannot but notice signs of wear and tear. All of this negative narrative we hear these days about the decline or even the dead of the church sometimes make us doubt. Um, when we look at the empty pews on Sunday mornings, ordinary Sunday mornings, the struggle to, the financial struggle to remain open, the, the aging of our membership, we doubt, we doubt. We're not sure we have the strength to continue. We don't know if we have the courage to go on. We wonder if we should simply move on and let the past be the past. And yet on moments, on special moments, maybe like this Sunday, when we remember, we remember who we are. We remember our purpose as a church in this community. And we say to ourselves, no, this cannot be the end. It cannot finish that way. We're not dead. We're still alive after all. And we're filled with, with Oh, IDs and, and project? No, yes, we can be a thriving church in this community, regardless of our numbers, regardless of our age. We can raise capital money to repair our organ and make it play for the next 25 years. We can respond faithfully to the needs of our neighbors. We can find ways to overcome the obstacle we encounter on our path. And you know what? And you know what? We can organize a grand celebration for this. We can send beautiful invitation to many, like many who are important, like the mayors, like a member of parliament, like other dignitaries in our community. It will be an amazing party. It will be huge. It will be like Jesus' parable of the great banquet and the gospel according to Luke. Yes, like Jesus' parable in Luke, we also use today. Yes, we work hard to prepare the great celebration. We invited many. And when we say, come for everything is ready, some of our guests did not show up as expected. I've bought a piece of land. I must go to see it. I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Just been married and therefore I cannot come. I don't need to show up on church on Sunday morning since my children are all grown up. I still remember that time when the board turned down one of my initiatives. 
Oh, I cannot accept that gays and lesbians are allowed to be married inside our church. So no, I'm not coming to your celebration. I'm staying home. And suddenly, our beautiful party does not go as well as we plan. And desperate, we look at each other and say, what's wrong with these people? Do they know that hosting a party is not that easy? They are realizing the number of hours we put into this. We have to prepare the right list of guests that might get along. We have to select the, the menu, the food that people might like to eat. We have work a schedule of activity and we are not yet touched on the actual act of inviting stranger into our house, into our intimacy. We're taking a significant risk here by exposing ourselves to the expectation, the judgment and the critics of others. And we even add, you know what? We should not even have to invite them. No, no, no. They should know already that they are invited. The prophet Isaiah said it clearly uh, that all invited. Chapter 55, verse 1. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. Who are have no money, come buy eat. Come buy wine, milk, without money, without cost. What else need to be added here? If people would come to church more often, if they were reading their Bible, if they were committed to their congregation, they would know they welcome in our non-judgmental church. Are all invited to our church? Oh yes, in theory. In real life, it's a little more complicated. We have rules, we have given ourselves memberships. And furthermore, Christianity carry a long history of exclusion based on age, status, disabilities, language, origin, or just the amount of pigments we have in our skin. Many were made felt uncomfortable because they were not wearing the right clothes, using the right words, or knowing exactly when to stand up or sit down. They left our midst feeling they were not valuable enough. And you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. I'm deeply convinced that all of us experience this feeling once, one way or another, at least once during our life. We know how it feels to be left out by our peers because we're not good enough. We remember how it felt when at school, when it was time to pick up for team, we were always selected last. We know how it feels to be the only one of our circle of friends to be not invited to a dinner party. We do not need many words to get that we do not belong. The same way I'm sure there are some people outside the walls of this building who would like to come in. There are some people who would like to bring their contribution, but they do not come in because they're too shy, because they do not believe they're allowed to show up, because Nobody cared enough to invite them personally. And it is exactly at those moments, in those situations, <clears throat> that we ought to remember who we are. As Christian, as disciple of Jesus the Christ, we are called not to wait patiently for the guests to arrive, but to reach out to the forgotten, the marginals, the excluded, the unloved, the poor. Our call is to follow the example of the parable that we read today and to go out once into the streets and lane of the town and bring those who are not necessarily valued and accepted by our churches, by our communities, by our world. And when we notice there's still room, we need to double down and reach out even further until all are invited, until our, 
all are told that they can come in. And today, we're not celebrating, just celebrating the 50th anniversary of Canada and United Church. We're also celebrating World Communion Sunday. A day set aside during the year when all Christians from around the world are invited to partake in this sacrament. The bread and the cup we share during the, share, the bread and the cup shared during the last meal, the Jesus take with his friend, are traditionally understood as a representation of what will happen in the heavenly banquet in the afterlife. However, the more I think about it, the more I believe that maybe it's the other way around. We celebrate the sacrament of communion, not to anticipate something in the future, but we celebrate it to remember the sacredness of sharing food with family and friends around the same table. Have you ever noticed that we have our best conversation when we eat with people we love, when we gather around uh, the same table where are often the best version of ourselves. Our tables are safe spaces for, our, for when we want to share our joy and our sorrow. And the meals we have here at Canada United Church once a month before choir practices, all our potlucks, all the coffee we drink and the cake we eat after worship, create and, and reinforce this community, this, this capacity to share and to bond to one another. Each time we pull an extra chair, each time we invite someone to join in because we believe in abundance, each time we share our bread and our cups, we remember who we are. We remember our purpose in this world. In a few minutes, we will celebrate the communion with the sacrament of communion with Christians from all around the world. And as we will experience the sacredness of eating from the same bread, from drinking from the same cup, maybe we will remember all of our forefathers and foremothers who were there for us in the past and who help us to understand the gifts God plays within each and every one of us. Maybe we will remember those who cannot be with us on this day because they are deceased, because they moved away, or because they did not accept our invitation for many different reasons. And we will also open the doors in a few minutes to let the children and the youth come in. And maybe they will help us to remember all of those who are excited, who are actually excited to be invited to join us, who are truly hungry for more, who wants to experience something special. Maybe we will remember we're part of a large continuum, a large circle of life that began before us and will finish way after us. Maybe we will remember to live between memory and hope on this Sunday, on this special day. Maybe we will remember who we truly are. Amen.